Hello and welcome to the Hard Sell, the programme where the stick in the swill bucket rattles back. It's another... Have a break. This one comes from August 1986, right in the middle of a piece of very, 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 very small British TV history. Soap operas aren't supposed to come to an end, they're constant. So when they do fall out of favour and die, it's... Usually, something of an event. Today's Have a Break comes from one of those times, but it absolutely was not. Albion Market was ITV's attempt at a spoiler via Granada for BBC's big Corrie rival EastEnders. Didn't work. Despite having a vastly superior theme tune, Granada's insistence that he go out on Friday nights was a bad idea for a start, especially since ITV's weekend schedule was pretty much the property of LWT at this point, and they didn't much appreciate Granada poking their big northern noses in. Granada is the oldest and most distinguished of the ITV companies finally prevailed only to find their big new continuing drama, because soap opera was far too lowbrow a term, scheduled against the all-conquering Lord Terence of Wogenshire. These days, if it's remembered at all, it's as the Eldorado of the 80s. Although that's a little unfair. It wasn't as howlingly shit as that show, just a bit glum and dull. Like Eldorado, though, it did only last a single year before being jettisoned. But at least Albion Market died from a lack of interest and not a tidal wave with largely well-earned negativity. The very last episode went out on Sunday the 24th of August 1986 to absolutely no publicity whatsoever. It was simply burnt away and no one noticed. Here are commercials from halfway through in the Yorkshire region. lunch, at dinner, at any time. First, beverages. An extended metaphor for country manor and how it should be served, in which country manor is represented by a country manor. Is that a synecdoche? No, not quite. Anyway, refrigeration is represented by snow in August, which certainly isn't. But it should always be chilled. What this advert doesn't do is explain what, precisely, Country Manor is. You're just supposed to know. Country Manor. At home, at any time. It's a perry. That is a pear cider. Yes, such things existed before the Orties made cider fashionable and hipsterish, and opportunistic brewers started making nominal ciders out of anything they could get their hands on down the greengrocers. Strawberries, blackcurrants, limes, lemons... Apparently blissfully unaware that all they'd done was reverse engineer Hooper's Hooch. Perry is the one that existed already. And as you can see, was once considered at least reasonably classy. Or if nothing else, to have the potential for classiness. Country Manor. At home, at any time. More beverages. It's late summer, everyone's thirsty, go figure. Schweppes made a lot of hay over the years out of the first phoneme of their name. Shh. Either by connecting it to the secret agent craze, complete with William Franklin's bespoke bond. Some people serve the strangest tonic water. Ah! Only you know whose tonic water has a secret of shh. A subtle, bittersweet effervescence. 
And the good manners not to spoil good gin. <laughs> it must have been something he had. Tonic water, Baish. You know who. An adult taste. Or is here pointing out its resemblance to a can or bottle of fizz being opened. Shh. You can hear the sounds of lovers in love. You know what I mean? Just the two of us and nobody else. This advert is about as root well as they come, but fun for its cross section of mid eighties cruelty. Kipley hairspray teen girls, perm denearing sophisticated lady types. Even the businessman in his suit and tie. And some inexplicable additions, like a nonplussed ostrich, or what appears to be Ronnie Biggs in hiding. No one is innocent. A whole world of soft drinks from... You know who. At last, new Yule Beauty Cleanser. God, finally! Robert Powell is very excited to introduce this to you because apparently it goes beneath dirt and makeup. It goes beyond dirt and makeup. See? To clean and moisturize from the stratum grandiosum itself, maybe? Who knows? It goes beyond dirt and makeup to reveal a more radiant complexion. A cleanser that gently helps lift away the day's dull, dry skin to reveal a new, fresh radiance. Yule Beauty Cleanser. Leaves your skin soft, smooth, and never greasy. Discover your natural radiance. Discover your natural radiance with Yule, the brand that at this point can't decide what it wants to be called. Yule? Ole? Olaz? Yulan? Spectrox? Ole was always the company's original name. But when they went global, they decided to diversify according to what sounded nicest in a certain accent or language, before realising around 2005 that doing that just made global marketing unnecessarily complicated and forcing Ole on most of the world whether they liked it or not. But before that, the Aussies got Yulan. Hang on a second. Oil of Yulan. Oil of Yule. Oil of Ole. No, I don't get it. Much of mainland Europe got, and indeed still have, Olaz. Yule was a variation for the British Isles, and I have to admit, I do prefer the way Yule sounds. Over and above any possible nostalgia factor as well. As an amateur semiotician, I should be able to explain that to you to some extent. But I can't. Discover your natural radiance. I'm baking. Take your jacket off, then. Ah, 2D animation. I still miss it. It has its own charms and utilities that 3D CGI does not and cannot. And vice versa, of course. Yes, it's your usual anthropomorphic shenanigans for the most part, but the character design is ultimately too distracting for its own good. Well, I can't. We're jacket potatoes, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Brian Glover here is apparently playing Potato Hitler. It's not just the moustache, he has the fringe and the short stature as well. Why did they choose to draw him like that? I mean, to be fair, there was a time when a flat cap and a tough brush moustache indicated every man in the popular consciousness, but that time was long before 1986. And then there's the fringe to contend with as well. They knew they were drawing Hitler as a potato. Maybe a storyboarders did it as a joke and expected someone to erase the tough brush moustache before going to the final animation boards. But they didn't. Hello, who's this? Hi, fellas. Mind if I join you? Mind? No, no. But we're just humble potatoes. Stick with me, boys. You could be really special. It kind of drowns out the message, which is that cream is delicious and also sexy, with a terrific set of gans. Yeah, maybe that's why they wanted to distract you. A spoonful of soured cream, a sprinkling of chopped chives, it's so quick and easy. Uh, are, are, there, are there any more at home like you? Oh, yes. I've got four delicious sisters. Hello. And yes, all those other pots of cream also came to life and had creepy adventures with horny, unprepossessing foodstuffs in other adverts. It wasn't the most successful campaign in the history of the milk marketing board. Get fresh with the cream. 
Anybody? Oh, speaking of which. This is part of the Everybody Needs Bottle campaign that was mostly notable for the way the adverts ended, which is to say, abruptly, with a shot of some milk bottles going clink. No on-screen text or anything, just a sort of audio-visual hieroglyph for advert stop now. The unsophisticated nature of this campaign was starting to date by 1986. The cheap, colourful, studio-based montage, the cheese-flavoured jingle, all a bit 70s, just a bit childish for our sophists, you know, palates by now, yeah. Within a couple of years, milk advertising would have transformed into moodily lit vignettes, shot on high-quality film on location in London, starring a sweaty Bob Geldof with a bleeding-edge soundtrack by Jan Hammer, all capped off with a proper slogan shot, or screen-filling modernist sans serifs and conceptual backdrop. Now that is how you sell staples to yuppies. You could argue it would be easier to keep it a secret and let the bastards starve, of course. But that's not sound business sense. A milk marketing board advert would be relatively cheap and easy to get hold of for the broadcaster. Not quite as much as a public information film would have, and indeed still does on occasion. The PIF truly is the default time filler. In fact, that's even the technical term within the broadcasting industry for it. Fillers. Stuff adverts, as we like to call them, are a step above public information films. The likes of the Milk Marketing Board or the Seafish Authority, as what we call non-departmental public bodies, exist at one remove from the government. Usually sponsored by one of its tendrils, Seafish, for instance, is funded through DEFRA, but theoretically at least semi-independent. By contrast, PIFs are explicitly messages direct from the government, often containing government logos to scare you with. Point is, stuff adverts, while more expensive than PIFs, are pretty cheap to buy and often fill the same function, filling up space in an unpromising commercial break, which promises low ratings and therefore low return. That this one just gave us two in a row, from the same marketing board yet, suggests that Yorkshire might have been having a little trouble selling this space on a Sunday evening in the middle of a final episode of a soap no one watched anyway. Ah, how's the chef doing? The steaks are on the barbecue, the salad's made, everything is uh, perfect. How good, Gareth Hunt acting like a pillock. It helps if you've seen some of the outtakes from his coffee period, which demonstrate that he had much the same attitude to these things as the viewer did. More emphatic. Yeah. <laughs> And the viewer didn't have to spend four hours under blazing studio lights in a suit and tie. To bring out the full, rich flavour of rich, tasting, wonderful, magnificent... He doesn't even get to do the bean shake this time. That duty's given over to Diane Keane. I don't believe it. I'll make some Nescafe. I don't believe it. Think of that special Nescafe blend and roast, that richer, smoother taste. Well, Eunice Stubbs actually makes the coffee which apparently takes us several hours. Coffee's ready. I don't believe there's a better tasting coffee. And it was what I suppose you'd call the punchline, except it's so wholly and unambiguously unfunny as to defy classification as humour. I love it when it's pouring. It's never explained why Gareth Hunt is cohabiting with two attractive females, but in a strange sort of way it doesn't have to be. He's Gareth Hunt, motherfucker. <laughs> Nescafe. Coffee at its best. Later, Una would be replaced with Sarah Green. But the real death knell for the campaign was sounded when Gareth himself left. We'll be telling us next is the hot favourite. <laughs> Tony Vadeshi simply couldn't fill the void. Nescafe. Coffee at its best. I mean, you're paying me the five pounds three and six. And then we're back with all our Albion market favourites, like something, something Helen Shapiro. 
Alas, even her star power couldn't make people care whether Albion Market lived or died. And because non-existence is very much the default option, that's what it did. So that'll drop a plane on it, I suppose. Ten minutes after the caffeinated polyamory of Gareth Hunt faded to black, Albion Market ended, with someone or other driving away, or I'd see him as the entire cast yelling goodbye and cheering in a highly symbolic gesture, and that terrific Nashville reggae theme tune blaring one last time. That really did deserve better. But if there was natural justice in the world, it would probably be pretty much unrecognisable from the one we live in now. Albion Market probably wouldn't have fared any better, though. people thank you for watching do you want to see these things a week before anyone else do you want access to even more video essays random musings and absurdist closed down based humor do you want to read and help shape my new book about the history of the British Broadcasting Corporation do you want me to continue to have food and shelter well consider that one a bonus Support me on Patreon now. Only good can come of it. I promise. <laughs>